Germany. Poland did not accept them, so the people were stranded in a no man's land. They were barely surviving under the harshest of conditions in a Polish camp. At that time, a 17-year-old young German-born Polish Jew was in Paris, and he learned his parents were in the camp. He became so full of anger about his parents' situation, they went to the German embassy in Paris with the intention of killing the German ambassador. Instead of kidding, killing the ambassador, he shot Ernst von Roth, who was the third secretary to the ambassador. This was on November 7, 1938. The secretary died two days later on November 9. While the Nazis were waiting for such an incident like this to justify an action against the Jewish people, Hitler gave his stormtroopers a free hand against the Jews. And when von Roth died on November 9, they went on a rampage of terror and destruction. Approximately 250 synagogues were set on fire. <clears throat> 815 shops were destroyed. Several hundred houses destroyed. And 30,000 Jewish men rounded up and sent to concentration camps. This action against the Jewish people came to be known as Kristallnacht because of the German word broken glass, uh, representing the broken glass from the shops and the synagogues that were destroyed by the Nazis. For most people in our world today, including here in America, this Kristallnacht is something that they might read as a footnote in a history book but not for the people who live through it. They will never forget, and neither should we. People who do not know history will eventually repeat it. And those of us who are Christians here this evening need this understanding so we can stand with our Jewish friends and say never again. And this is why we are having this special evening event tonight. And I know that the survivors are are getting older and we thank them for their courage to begin to tell their stories and our commitment to the survivors is when your time has passed on this earth we'll take up the mantle and tell your story for you at this time we want to light the candles on our IHCS wall of remembrance and we have some candle lighting assistants who are going to come and help us with that this wall of remembrance has a very uh, has very significant place names carved in it both in Hebrew and in English along with the star of David and a place for lighting a candle the Nazis had hundreds of death camps and killing fields and we certainly cannot put all of them on the wall these are just representative of the many at the end of our event tonight, I invite all of you to come by and take a closer view of the Wall of Remembrance. And perhaps at that time, you can make your own silent pledge of never again. Now we're going to have Ed Alday and Lyle and Dana Anderson, representing the Christian community, to come and light the candles. Ed and Lyle and Dana. Where's Lyle and Dana? Here they come. I'll read a few of these place names while they're doing this. Auschwitz began to function in June 1940, the greatest killing camp during the Holocaust period. Some of you who are survivors will find your camp here shown. Three different camps in Auschwitz, of which Birkenau Camp was the largest of the killing centers. Before the camp was overrun by the Soviet army, more than one million men, women, and children were murdered inside its gates. Bobby Yar, another one that's mentioned here, a ravine situated in the northwestern part of Kiev, where on two terrible days, September 29 and September 30, 1941, German special killing units shot over 33,000 Jews to death on two days. In the course of several months thereafter, over 100,000 Jews were murdered at the Bobby Yar Ravine. Bergen-Belsen is mentioned here. A camp was established in 1943. 
Nearly 100,000 prisoners died in the camp before and after its liberation on April 15, 1945 by the British Army. Among those who died in the camp was Anne Frank. Buchenwald is listed here, again, <clears throat> one of the most notorious of the camps. Among the liberated prisoners was Ellie Weissel, Dachau, so many others that are listed here, Sobibor, one of the killing centers in the eastern part of Poland was a very uh, terrible place guarded by Ukrainian guards that acted as the security and camp guard force. By the end of 1943, Sobibor had been liquidated as a killing center and no trace of the camp was left. Treblinka was one of the most notorious of the Nazi killing centers. The camp was located in a sparsely populated area in the northeastern corner of Poland. The mass murder of Treblinka went into effect on July 1942. In a killing frenzy, which perhaps even outdid the Auschwitz atrocities, over 870,000 men, women, and children were murdered before the camp was shut down in the fall of 1943. In early 1943, Himmler visited the camp and ordered that an operation be instituted which would burn the corpses of the murdered victims. This plan was an effort to kill the Jews a second time by obliterating their physical remains. And there are many other place names here that I hope you'll come by and, and view more closely after our presentation is over this evening. Tonight we have a wonderful guest, Helen Colon, who's going to come in a few moments and share with us. Helen was born in Poland and reared in a comfortable, caring home with loving parents. At age 16, think about that, young teenage girl, Helen and her family were forced into a Jewish ghetto where Helen stayed for four years. When the Germans liquidated the ghetto, Helen and her family were sent to Auschwitz where her father and mother, little sister and brother, all perished. Helen and her older sister, Stefa, were the only survivors. They were then sent to Bergen-Belsen, where clearing bodies was one of their duties. After the war, Helen came to America to begin a new life and was blessed with a new family. Her story is documented on videotape at the Holocaust Museum Houston, we get to see you, Helen, every time we take a tour down there, as well as by Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation. We're so blessed and honored to have Helen with us tonight, and as you hear her story and feel her heart, I know you'll all come to love her as Peggy and I have. Would you give a warm HCS welcome to Helen as she comes now? I think we would all agree that roses are so special and we wanted to do something just special for Helen coming to be with us this evening. I know that you would know that every time a survivor tells their story, it's like opening up the womb again and again. And so we, spe we just trust that tonight is going to be a night of blessing to you and healing again to you. so much. Thank you, Dr. Booker, Ms. Booker, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for inviting me. Good evening and Shabbat Shalom. I would only tell you a little bit what I endured during Hitler. It was unexpected 
just as it would be unexpected for anybody to barge in here and show you a, a rifle or a gun. That would have been unacceptable, right? Well, my home was very cherished, and I thought I was, I had, my mother and my father was God to me. My grandparents thought that we were the angels of this world. I don't know why, but perhaps now that I am a grandmother, I feel the same way. <laughs> we were not angels, but certainly we had a beautiful life. Very loving family. My father was 49 years old when I lost him in the ghetto. He died of starvation in the Lodz ghetto. We found him, my sister, my older sister that survived, and I found him in a pile of bodies in rolls lying in the morgue. My sister and I decided that we're gonna look through those bodies until we find our father because curfew was on the night before and daddy did not come home. We assumed that daddy perished, daddy died of starvation. And he sure did. We found him in the morgue and my sister and I removed all the bodies that were lying on top of him. And we carried our father and with our own bare hands, we dug a little grave in the back of the morgue and buried our daddy, 49 years old. When we found him, his eyes were open and his mouth was open. And we thought for sure he was begging for another meal so he can survive another day. But it wasn't meant. On the way home, my sister says, you're gonna tell mother. I said, no, you're the oldest, you're gonna tell mother. Needless to say, when we walked in, we have cried so much all the way home. We didn't have to say anything. My mother kept repeating and holding us all children together. Daddy is gone, daddy is gone, daddy is gone. Repeatedly, she said that. And we didn't have to say anything because she had the feeling that daddy was gone. This was my first experience of uh, being really misplaced, like a, like a person of, with uh, no life, like a dead body. The next, this was in progression. I'm making it very short because I'm not supposed to. Thank you, Donnie, so much. Thank you. You know, in different, at different times, thank you, ma'am. At different times, they told us to do different things. They moved us out of our home with just what we had on our back moved us into the ghetto, Lodz ghetto. Somebody is here. Mr. K was there too, right? We were walking in the street over bodies. Young, old, it didn't matter. Those that couldn't make it would just die in the street. We had no trucks, no cars, to pick up those bodies. So the, main, the men were very resourceful and they made little from bicycle tires and an old uh, door or something, they made a, a, a wagon and they picked up constantly different people in the street just to clear the streets. I got very, very sick in the ghetto I had tuberculosis and I was 16 years old and my mother said, come, we're going to go to your uncle. He was a physician, very prominent physician. And she took me by the hand like a little girl. And I remember like today, we walked in 
And she says, my daughter is very sick. You, you must do something. And he says, Auntie, I will listen to her. He took his stethoscope out and he listened to me and he says, I agree, she is very ill. But he opened that old fashioned satchel and he says, I haven't got an aspirin to give her. I have nothing. And so he kissed me and we went home. Mother was crying all the way. I was coughing my head off all the way. And somehow, I don't know, I survived. I was four years in the ghetto. Then came the liquidation of the ghetto where we had to report. It was mother, my older sister, three years older, and I, my brother, 13, my little sister, nine. We all reported to the station, to the railroad station. When we got there, we had a shocking surprise. They loaded us, loaded us on those cattle cars, as many as they could pack in. We got to Auschwitz, needless to say, very many perished in the road. It should have taken only four hours from Lodz to Auschwitz. It took two days and two nights. And I don't have to tell you when they opened those, the guards opened the doors when we arrived in Auschwitz. We were totally shocked. We were behind the bars, electric bars, you know, and behind on the other side was a beautiful orchestra playing beautiful symphony. And here we got off the train, barely off the train. We couldn't, some of us couldn't stand up. And uniformed men with big German shepherds. You go to the right, you go to the left, and we didn't know what happened. And uh, men separate and women separate, and here is the orchestra playing. And we were like in a, in a crazy place. It wasn't real. It's still, when I think about it, it doesn't sound like it was, it was on this earth because this couldn't happen. Needless to say, my little sister was sent on one side and my mother being very young, they pushed her on the side with me and my sister. My little sister turned around and she cried out. She says, Mommy, Mommy, Helen and Stepha will take care of themselves, the big girls. I want you, Mommy. Until this very day, I see my mother waving to us. Take care of yourself, big girls. Take care of yourself, big girls. We'll see you. I'm going with the baby. I have never seen her again. And I believe I never will see her. But I see her face without having a picture because they took everything away from us in Auschwitz. I see her every moment in my life. Because what I've got, I have it from my parents. That's what they gave me. Compassion that I would never give up for anything else. Compassion and love for everybody. I have plenty of love to give, and I'm not gonna die with it. I'm gonna share it with everyone. I, I really have endured a lot, but I suppose somebody up there wanted me to survive. I went through one year of Auschwitz and many other little camps, and the last one was Bergen-Belsen. 
In Bergen-Belsen, we were assigned every day to different jobs that consist of cleaning streets or cleaning bricks so the bricklayer could use them and restock again the bomb houses or the bomb factories. I met a bricklayer. He was not allowed to communicate with me. But nevertheless, he could feel that I am sick. And I remember, like today, he was an older gentleman, and I said, as I was walking, I says, Opa, means grandpa, I don't feel good. He says, I know, my child. I know you don't feel good. He must have been 60, and I was 21. And I called him Opa. He was so thrilled, you know. He went to the doctor, and he described the sickness. My wife is so sick, she doesn't want to come to the doctor. She coughs, and she coughs, and blood comes out. And he says, you have to do something. You have to give me something. The doctor gave him a little medicine. And when he brought it the next day, he had wrapped it in a, in a uh, German paper to let us read and see how close from each direction the German, the uh, British are and the Americans. And he says, you must hold on. You must survive. You will not die. I says, Opa, I want to die here. I can't take it any longer. I am so sick. He says, I know you're sick. But take this, take two sips now. So he hid me. And it was in a, between bricks, you know, hidden, that bottle. When I brought it back to the camp, the girl said, he is a German, he wants you to die. I says, no great loss, I'll, I'll try it anyway. Sure enough, I felt better, I stopped after a few days, I stopped coughing. And this was heaven, you know, that I, I didn't have to cough. So you see, you find good people everywhere. It just takes a little compassion. It takes a little know-how. It takes a little willingness. And I feel strongly, in all sincerity, that somebody up there wanted me alive can you imagine to be in Bergen, in Bergen Belsen, where I was liberated, the night before my birthday? They have distributed the Germans an extra ration of bread in the barrack next to us, which was about 600 to 800 women. And I cried to my sister, until today she, she really teases me. And she, I says, tomorrow is my birthday, I wish I had a piece of bread. One extra slice of bread, wouldn't that be wonderful? And she said, you know, it was too late, they couldn't distribute it. Let's probably start with our barrack tomorrow. The next morning was my birthday. We were not awakened by whistles and shouts, you dirty pigs, you get up. It was silence, total silence. And it was already past the hour that we were supposed to go to work. My sister was very bold. She went to the door and cracked it open. And she turned around and couldn't say the word, but she whispered, she says, I think we're free. I think we're free. I saw a Red Cross tank. I saw a Red Cross tank. At that moment, all of us bolted that door open, and we ran out, just like really prisoners out, out of, a, like, they're dogs out of a cage, not prisoners, because we were emaciated. We couldn't particularly talk. We didn't, we were afraid of, even of the British, those were the British that liberated 
Bergen-Belsen. And it happened to be on my birthday, April 15th, right? <laughs> Am I one of the luckiest people on earth? Do I really, I, many times I ask myself, do I deserve this? Do I really, what have I done? My little sister didn't do anything wrong, and she had to be killed. My mother was a, a school mom. She was always at school, whether it was Christmas or it was New Year's or it was a Jewish holiday, she was there to participate in the place. And every child, all of us had to participate in every play. My mother was called always to the uh, school mom because she was always there. And I, why did she, was she taken away from us? A person that had not one hair in her body was mean. She was so good to all of us, to all of her friends. She was so cherished in the immediate family and all her friends, they had no words. Now I ask you, why could this happen? And I'll tell you why. Because you and you and you didn't stand up for us. This is why. You know, I found a poem written by a German priest that was incarcerated by Hitler seven years. He died in the camp, but he left a poem that I'd like to share with you, if you would allow me, because it will give you an idea how important it is to be involved. I have to put on my glasses. The pastor's name was Neumeyer. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the labor leaders, and I did not speak out because I was not a labor leader. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. So I beg you, be vigilant. Give everybody an opportunity to live their life the way they choose. Because we only have one life. And this life, when we leave, we all want to leave some footprints. went to, we had seen 
at least six, seven doctors. Finally, I went to one doctor and I walked in and I says, I'm not leaving, you got to make me ha well. I have tomorrow a big, big thing to do and you're gonna do something for me. <laughs> and, and that's the truth, you know. And he couldn't escape it because I'm in the same building, so he couldn't run away too far. So he gave me a, a cortisone shot here, a cortisone here, a cortisone on each of my thighs, and thank goodness I'm here. <laughs> I truly believe that you are a crowd that can make the difference. The difference between being a good person or a bad. It's all up to all of us. And I have learned something that goodness brings goodness. You know, I'll give you a little example. I have a designated parking in my building where I work. And uh, coming into the elevator, going up to my crosswalk floor, there was a doctor already in there in his white coat with the stethoscope showing, you know, in his pocket. And I said, good morning. He did not answer me. And I said to myself, oh boy, he must have a very serious case. Probably he's way out there somewhere. But when I came to my floor, he held the door open for me. And I turned around and I said, your mother did a good job. You are a gentleman. <laughs> You know, until today, every time that he passes me by and his wife, they invite me to have lunch with them. Many times, I have no time to go for lunch. But he's been so nice. He says, did you, and each time he sees me, he says, did you forgive me really that I didn't answer you? And I says, it didn't enter my mind. I says, I knew that you had so many worse things to do. You know, you probably had a bad, bad patient. So, of course, you're forgiven. So, he's my best friend. He's not the doctor, by the way, that gave me the shots. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, you see, goodness brings goodness. It could have been interpreted by somebody else, perhaps, that hasn't gone through so much hell as I did, part my friend. And, you know, but... I didn't even think, I, I immediately thought, oh, this man must have a very serious patient, and I, I must not think about it. But nevertheless, I turned around and I thanked him for holding the door. So I made a good friend. His wife brought me home pickles. She pickled jars of pickles she brought me, you know? So you have to be nice to people. It just, just doesn't cost anything, seriously. And I, I, for one, feel that I've been rewarded with so much goodness just to be a citizen of this wonderful country of ours. And don't think for one moment that we did not feel the pain on the 11th of September. We survivors have felt it probably more. I still now, as I speak, I have goose pimples that this could happen to my beloved country. Couldn't happen. Why did it happen? I have, I have gone through nightmares from this incident, you know, and it, it hurts deep down. But nevertheless, Americans are survivors. And since I'm an adopted American, I'm a survivor too. So let's all hope that the worst is over and we begin to live every day promising ourselves that we do one good deed, even if you just turn around to your neighbor and say, why are you so, uh, you look like you don't feel good. Could I do something for you? Just, just a good word. You'd be surprised how it helps. And I beg you, try it. It'll heal your heart. I know, because in the beginning when I survived, I was very, very angry. I remember 
I, I had an interview with a chaplain in Bergen-Belsen two days after my liberation. As a matter of fact, it's showing in the Washington Museum the, the, uh, the interview with the chaplain that was in Bergen-Belsen in front of the mass graves of all the bodies that were just thrown in the day before we were ushering those bodies into the graves. When they were captured, some of the German guards, they had to do it. And I tell you, that interview, I didn't know was videotaped. What did I know about a video at the time? I was 21 years old. I was still five years already incarcerated for no reason at all. I didn't know why. And gone through hell on earth. And then, lying in my home, just about four years ago, I was reading. And I said, oh my goodness, it's 10 o'clock. I better switch on the news. I want to hear the news. And I turned down the television, and it was, it was uh, on Channel 8. And I saw myself the first time, as I was 21 years old, I saw myself on that television. And I said, my God, I had goose pimples, I had chills. I said, I'm not back there. I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm in, my, I'm in my house. It couldn't be, I couldn't be there. But then moments later, my children called, and my sister, and they said, Mom, you're on television. You're being interviewed by the British chaplain. I said, yes, I thought I was back in, in Bergen-Belsen. I was so scared. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't even, I didn't know where the telephone was. I, I was terribly, it was really a trauma for me, because I didn't know. So now I found out my, daughter, my son, and my grandson were in Washington, D.C., and they said, your story is right there, Mom. And my grandson calls me, he says, Ma, you were a good, you were so pretty, Nana. You were so pretty. <laughs> you know, which means you're not so pretty now. No, <laughs> no, he says, you're very pretty now, but you were prettier then. <laughs> so you see, uh, those things you can't forget, and when you, when you, I, I suppose there was a reason for me to survive, because for the last 45 years, when we didn't have the museum, I and some, uh, some few people that are here would go to different schools, would go to any end of this, the road to speak to schools, to tell those kids, the kids and adults, to be vigilant, to be alert, be respectful, and be kind. That's all there is. It costs nothing. When I was a little girl, my mother used to always say, it costs nothing to be nice, so just remember. She used to tell me that when I was a little bitty kid. And believe me, they were true words. And for that, I'm grateful that, that I really had at least a little upbringing. 16 years, I was still very naive, probably to a point of stupidity. I didn't know there was a war. A war. I didn't know there was people like Hitler that would do something so disgusting, so despicable to any human being. It's, it's really, I, I, I could never imagine. And now, after so many years, speaking to so many people, sometimes I come home after a speech like this and I lie in bed and look at the ceiling and I say, how could I have gone through this? How could any human being go through this? No food. For five years, I didn't see a, 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 a bar of soap. I didn't see a toothbrush, a toothpaste. It was, it was really incredible. And what you see on film is very, unfortunately, very, very true. And I can go on and on, but I'll probably be ushered out here. <laughs> so with 
all my heart, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me, and by all means, be vigilant, be good to each other, because we're gonna really make a better world by being just kind. Thank you, and shalom.
separate piece of paper <clears throat> that has uh, some information on it for you that we're going to read through here in just a moment as we're drawing close to a close. Still have the Israeli national anthem to sing, <clears throat> so we're not quite through yet. <clears throat> but uh, for those who may not be familiar with the Kaddish, the Mourner's Prayer, it's an ancient Jewish prayer glorifying God in times of mourning and distress. And tonight we join with our Jewish friends in reciting this prayer as an expression of our faith in the Almighty and His ability to take our burdens and comfort us as we mourn the loss of those who perished in the Holocaust. <clears throat> Would you recite the Kaddish with me? May his great name grow exalted and sanctified in the world that he created as he willed. May he give reign to his kingship in your lifetimes and in your days, and in the lifetimes of the entire family of Israel, swiftly and soon. Amen. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, mighty, upraised, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he beyond any blessing and song praise and consolation that are uttered in the world. Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel. Amen. He who makes peace in his heights may make peace upon us and upon all Israel. Amen. Now this next part is for the Christians who are here this evening who may have not had the opportunity to study church history be aware of the atrocities done to the Jewish people in the name of Christianity. Because church history is our Christian history, good or bad, we are linked to our past. When Ezra and Daniel realized the corporate consequences of Israel's sins, they were wise enough to understand the need to stand in the gap for the nation through prayer and repentance and intercession. It's what we're all going Washington Wednesday to do, even though they themselves had not personally committed the sins that grieve the Lord. Tonight we have the same opportunity to stand in the gap for the past sins of the corporate church and ask the Lord's forgiveness through the following prayer of repentance. For the Christians here this evening, <clears throat> if you'd recite this prayer with me, I recognize that for centuries the Christian church has been characterized by anti-Semitism manifested in doctrines and words that negatively stereotype Jewish people plus deeds of violence and murder against Jews. While not personally responsible for the past, as a Christian I recognize my connection to the historic church and that we still suffer the consequences of its doctrines and deeds like Ezra and Daniel, who repented on behalf of all their people. I acknowledge, confess, and renounce the individual and corporate sins of the Christian church against the Jewish people. Specifically, I repent on behalf of the Christian church and myself, any sins of Judeophobia, the fear of Jews and things Jewish, anti-Semitism, attempts to stereotype, dehumanize, debase, belittle, destroy the Jewish people, silence and absence of protests against others who abuse the Jewish people. I confess the sins of our governmental leaders for not standing on the Lord's side concerning his divine purposes and will for the Jewish people and their divine right to live in peace in the land given to them by the Almighty. I ask the Lord's forgiveness and cleansing for any of these sins in my own life and I commit myself to stand with the international Jewish community against any individual or corporate threat. I confess my identity with the Jewish community because of my faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With the help from the Almighty, 